You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. We've all been there. You're standing in a museum, staring at a painting, and all you can think is, I don't get it. To me, knowing the story behind an artwork is a huge part of knowing how to look at it. I'm Amanda, the host of the Art of History podcast, where we view history through the lens of some really great works of art. Each episode, we dive deep into the bigger picture behind some familiar and maybe not so familiar pieces. Check out Art of History now wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, everyone. It's Takuyi here. And I'm Gabby. And we are the hosts of History of Everything, a podcast which you can probably guess by the name is, well, I mean, it's about everything. Do you want to know why people thought potatoes were evil and would give you syphilis? Are you curious about all the stories of the terrible and stupid ways that people have kicked the bucket over the years? Do you want to hear tales about all of the different badasses of history and the lives that they had brought to life? Well, if so, then look no further. History of Everything is just the right podcast for you. It's available on Spotify, Pandora, and anywhere else that you get your podcast from. Join us for some fun and just see how weird and wacky history can be. Hello, delicious friends, and welcome to Who Did What Now, the history podcast that's not your history class. With me, your host, Katie Charlwood, history harlot and reader of books. I hope you had a fantastic weekend. I clearly, I did. Uh, as you can tell from my lack of voice, yeah, I was in Belfast for La Fila Padraig or the St. Patrick's Festival. I was there with my cousins, many of whom, many of them, two of whom I hadn't seen in like solid decade, like a full 10 years. See, a few years ago, we actually made the decision that we were no longer only going to see each other at funerals because that seems to be our main family social gathering. And, you know, in general, your social life shouldn't revolve around funerals unless you're just, you know, that level of goth and bereavements, wakes and other such grieving opportunities are, you know, just your, you know, fun times. Live your best life. So, yeah, we decided we were no longer going to do that. And so we were actively trying to, like, meet up and do things. So we went to Galway for our cousin's 40th and then we went to... Belfast for Paddy's Day and you know we're just starting to go about and actually do things. It was really funny because my mum was asking me like you know where many people were like asking to take photos with you and stuff in Belfast and I was like no I didn't get recognised once. (laughs) Nobody knew who I was um, which is uh, fun because like again I always get recognised in really weird places and people come over to me and talk to me but like yeah not one person <laughs> recognised me <laughs> at all the entire time, which uh, is quite nice, but also a wee bit annoying. <laughs> Would have been cool for someone to be like, hey, I listen to your podcast, you're cool. Um, but I know what you're thinking, you're thinking, go your jibber jabber, in fact me. In fact you I will. But first, we've got to get our source on. Our sources are The Black Widows of Liverpool, A Chilling Account of Cold-Blooded Murder in the Victorian City by Angela Brabin. Arsenic and the Black Widows by the University of Liverpool. Female Poisoners, An Arsenical Solution of Flypapers. Unexampled Cruelty by the Te Ahura News. We have articles from the Liverpool Echo, the Liverpool Post and the Evening Daily Post. The UK Census, 1861, 1871 and 1881. And of course we have the crimemuseum.org. Are you sitting comfortably? Good, then let's begin. Our sordid story starts in Liverpool, 1884. And this Victorian port town was hustling and bustling. And you know, you've got industrial stuff going on that was very very involved wasn't it industrial stuff you've got the port there's docks there's always something going on and because it's an industrial town and because it is a port town this victorian city is prime for 
emigration, employment, unemployment, and poverty. Where is Liverpool? North. Yes, north. Little Saltburn quote for you there. The thing about Liverpool as well is that if you travel west, like get on a boat and go, you're going to hit Ireland. And at this point, Ireland was still under British rule. And in the 1880s, there had been an influx of immigration specifically from Ireland as a direct result of Angorta Moor, um, the Great Hunger, uh, which you may know as the Famine. So many Irish people settled in Liverpool, not only because it was fairly close, it was a short enough journey, but because of the type of town it was, because it was industrial, because it was a port town, there was more options for employment and opportunity and work. And this worked very well for a lot of people. Like to the point now that within Liverpool today, there is 75% of the population which has Irish heritage. And back in the 1880s, there would be these clusters of sort of Irish settlements within the city. And that's the thing though, right? If you move to somewhere, somewhere you don't know, like, where do you go? Next to someone who's just like you. Like, and that's where, like, these kind of areas would begin. That's why you would have, like, Little Italy or Soho. It's because you go to people that are part of your culture, people who speak your language. And so within these areas, you know, this particular culture... Um, they'll become quite dense, which will lead to some people being like, oh, we're being overrun. It's like, no, you're just in, like, the Irish part of town, you know? And what's really interesting is the way that the streets were built back then. So you would have a street, and then behind those buildings, there would be smaller buildings. There would be these little houses. These tended to be closer to the docks, and they were cheaper to live in. And then these sort of boarding houses and rooming houses would just sort of prop up into them. And these streets, they were designed in such a way that really, if you didn't know where you were going, you could very easily get lost. But if you've lived there for most of your life, well, then you know what you're doing. So you've got a lot of people who are living in this area. They, most of them are, you know, migrants and they've settled or they're second generation and they become these communities. And when you have these low-income communities, when you have people living in poverty, when you have poverty, you have crime. Because sometimes it's not easy making an honest living. And so brings us, which brings us to the linchpin of our story, the suspicious death of one Thomas Higgins. In September of 1883, the 45-year-old hod carrier gets severely ill. Now, you may be wondering what a hod carrier is. Basically, they transport building materials, like they'll be carrying out bricks and other such heavy goods. And so he was fairly fit, you know, 45, but still, you know, strong and relatively healthy. And he starts getting these, like, aggressive stomach pains. And his wife calls a doctor, Dr. Whitford. And he comes in and he checks him over and he's like, Yeah, uh, you've got dysentery? I don't want ever to get dysentery, Dad. You'll never have to worry about that, son. He did. But yes, Dr. Whitford diagnoses him of having dysentery as a result of drinking bad whiskey. Now, bear in mind that in this era, the water isn't exactly the cleanest. You've got like one fountain on the street and there's there's probably feces in it. We're not going to lie. Probably. It's not the healthiest of water. You've got runoff from, you know, factories and the docks were not the safest place to be either. And so there, there's a lot of stuff in the water. So it was actually cleaner and safer to drink like beer 
and whiskey than it was to drink water. But Thomas did also like a bit of a tipple. Because, you know, odd carriers, don't they all? And so he ends up being diagnosed with this and the doctor prescribes him opium and castor oil. Yes, castor oil, the thing that everyone is saying is making your skin perfect now. Maybe good, but maybe not the opium. Anyway, he gets prescribed this, but it doesn't help because two days later, Thomas has passed away, leaving behind a widow, Margaret Higgins, and his surviving brother, Patrick. Now, Patrick has a wee bee in his bonnet because he's thinking, that's weird, that's suspicious, because Thomas, as we know, pretty healthy, pretty fit, pretty strong. He's like, he was left in bricks like a few days before and you're telling me suddenly he's got dysentery. Like, I know he wasn't the cleanest of people, but that's a bit much. And so he goes and starts investigating because he's thinking this whole situation is well sus. And so he goes to an insurance broker And then he goes to another insurance broker. And then he goes to another one. And all in all, he discovers that there's a life insurance policy. Sort of. It's not quite a life insurance policy. It's a policy with a burial society. And there's a good few of them. There's five in total. There are five separate policies put with these burial societies. And the benefactor of these burial societies, the person who's going to collect the money, Thomas's grieving widow, Margaret, with her coming out with a profit of a hundred pounds. So in today's money, that's like 15 grand. Like it's a good chunk of change. It's life changing money. And so she's about to get this massive payout because she's taken it from all these different societies. And... So after finding this out, Patrick Higgins goes to a doctor, explains his theory. His doctor gets a coroner and the doctor and the coroner head straight to Margaret's house where Thomas is being waked. And it's the day of the funeral and they are rushing because it is a race against time at this point because they are about to take the body and they're getting ready for the funeral. So they make it to the house just in time and they perform an autopsy right there in the house on Thomas's body. And so the doctor and the coroner, they do these tests and they take out the organs and the stomach contents and after some chemical analysis, it basically shows that Thomas Higgins was a victim of arsenic poisoning. And so the police are called. And the moment, you know, the sound of the police start coming up to the house, Margaret's sister, Catherine Flanagan, also a widow, straight up legs it out the door and disappears through these winding streets. Why did the widow's sister flee upon hearing that the authorities were coming? Well, we're going to have to go back in time a little bit. So, in the 1860s, Catherine Flanagan was living in Liverpool with her husband, John. They would go on to have two children, a boy and a girl, John and Ellen, a gentleman's family, some might say. Catherine and her younger sister, Margaret, had emigrated to Liverpool because, well, probably because of Angorta Moore, the famine. See, there's 14 years between the sisters, with Catherine being born in 1829 and Margaret in 1843. So they were both born just before the famine. Now, I will go into greater detail about the famine in another episode specifically, just not this one. I, I don't have the voice for it, lads. Now, Angorta Moore, the blight especially, started in 1845 and ended about 
1852. So, both of these women were alive pre-enduring this. And during this time, there's like mass immigration. Because, you know, people are starving. And needless to say, doubt they had the easiest of lives. Doesn't, doesn't excuse the shit they do. But they didn't have the easiest of lives. But by the 1860s, they are living in Liverpool. And Catherine is a beer house keeper at this point. And so a beer house was, it's basically a pub, it's a tavern. But it only sold um, sort of beer, sort of fermented drinks. And it was in direct response to like the gin epidemic because everyone was drinking gin and the gin it was it was not regulated so it wasn't great and so to combat that they had these beer houses and so she was a beer housekeeper now after this um after about 1871 she still registered as living with john catherine's husband john had passed away from pneumonia in 1879 so the entire time that Catherine and Margaret actually lived in Liverpool, they stayed within these sort of pockets, these Irish areas. Like this was their community and this is where they stayed. So by the 1880s, and by the time we get to the 1880s, Catherine is a licensed broker. Now, I want you to bear in mind something as well. Margaret and Catherine are both illiterate. Um, but Catherine has a number brain. Like, she has a brain for maths. Like, she's a very wily woman. I feel like if she had, like, a proper education, she could have gone on to done some amazing things. But again, this is a woman in the past and is a product of her environment in many ways. Again, not negating the bad stuff she's done, right? But she's a licensed broker. And so she would broker between sort of insurance agents and sort of people getting policies. So she would earn commission from that. So this commission would basically be, for a lot of people, like a year's worth of policy, you know. And that's a good, that's a good amount. You know, she's making money off this. But she's also running a rooming house. So by 1880, Catherine and Margaret are running a a boarding house, a rooming house on 5 Scarving Street. And this is near Scotland Road, which ironically, full of Irish people. So they're running these boarding houses and people come in and out. You know, it's a poverty driven area. It's probably one step above a flop house. Like, it's not, it's not even the quality of a premier inn. You know what I mean? But running a rooming house near the docks, you know, is a fairly decent way to make a living. So in the boarding house in Scarving Street, we have Catherine Flanagan, her younger sister Margaret, Catherine's son John Flanagan, Widower Thomas Higgins and his daughter Mary. Widower Patrick Jennings and his teenage daughter Margaret. So they're all staying in this this boarding house. Now, because it's, you know, a very poverty-stricken area and the hygiene isn't the best, you've got cholera, you've got dysentery, you've got bronchial stuff. You know, anything that's going about, you know, there is a high chance you're going to catch it. And you'll have illnesses that will go from room to room. And lots of, like, lodging houses, rooming houses, boarding houses, they will get, like, shut down and closed off because, you know, disease spreads. So it wasn't uncommon in these working class areas for there to be, like, a high, like, level of fatalities, either from you know, dangerous jobs, because if you're working in the docks or you're you're working in industry and, you know, and then, of course, you've got injury and then illness, like, there's a lot coming for you. 
So a lot of people would have a sort of a sort of life insurance, except it was for a funeral policy. So think about this area in this time. You've got a massive amount of Irish immigrants. I mean, you've got other people too, but like people at this point in time are still very, very religious, you know, very Christian, you know, super big fans of Jesus. And a proper Christian burial is really, really important to these people. And they want to be able to afford that. They don't want to chuck somebody in a pauper's grave. No, they want like a good Christian burial. So regardless of whichever flavour of Christian you were, be it Anglican, Presbyterian, Catholic, whatever, like you needed to, you know, rest in peace. So these burial societies were set up, I think originally by the Dutch, but like, I'll double check that at some point. But these burial societies were set up um, and you would pay for a period of time so that you could then, you know, get a payout if somebody passed away and you could afford to bury them. Now, a lot of the times it would be the breadwinner of the family, which is usually the man, the person who was making the most money. You would have a burial policy out on them because, you know, you need to do that and you need to survive after that. So Hopefully there would be some left over after the burial. Now the way it worked was you were only supposed to have one policy, like per person, and with one sort of burial society. But of course, where there is a will, there is a way. And so, this may shock you, but um, some people took advantage of this system and they would apply to several different burial societies. But you need to be able to afford the outgoings first. So if you're paying one burial society, like two shillings, and this one, you know, ten pence, and, you know, so on and so forth, you need to keep track of that. You need to have that in your mind. And you need to be able to follow your trail and know who you're paying when and what your payout's going to be. And in order to get a policy approved, there has to be, like, several people involved. So the first things first, they need to approve it through a broker. The insurance agent needs to agree. And then you have to have, like once a person passes away, the doctor needs to sign off that it's a natural death or, or whatever kind of death. But like it can't be, you know, murder, you know. And so that has to be approved in order for that to go back and get approved by the society in order to release the money. And depending on the type of policy, if it's a larger policy, then, you know, the insurance agent needs to physically meet with the person who wants the policy. So if Big Jim over here is having a massive policy, the insurance agent's going to come over and meet him, make sure that it's all tipped up, and then take away. Just before Christmas in 1880, Catherine's 22-year-old son, John Flanagan, starts getting these stomach pains and he's feeling really sick and ill and he is telling everybody just how unwell he's feeling. And John was fairly healthy up until this point, fairly strong, fairly decent, but then just took this turn and he ends up getting really ill and then passes away. In order to bury her son, Catherine requires the money from the burial society. And so the doctor comes over, determines the cause of death as bronchitis. It's a natural death, you know. It's it's relatively vague, but there it is. And so Catherine goes and collects the sum of money, which is £70, which is in today's money, like five grand or something maybe a bit more and she's been paying it like for quite a while as well so you know it's not a huge amount left over at the end but there's you know it's a decent chunk not long after the passing of her nephew a romance starts blossoming in the Scarving Street lodging house between Margaret and one of the boarders Thomas Higgins the couple are married by 1882 
Sorry, I said that Thomas Higgins was 45. He was not. He was 36. He was a toy boy. <laughs> yes, he was 36. And he went for the older Margaret Higgins. Clearly there was something special there. So yeah, they start wooing, courting, and eventually are wed. So they get married in 1882. But that same year, Margaret had actually spent time behind bars. She had been in prison for seven days for a drunkenness, effectively. But they get married and she becomes stepmother to young Mary. So they get married in the October. And, you know, before it even hits Christmas of 1882, Thomas's daughter becomes ill and she passes away. And it's her stepmother, Margaret, that collects the burial society policy. All £22 of it. Now, it, it's a kid's policy, so it's going to be smaller anyway. And yeah, it, it's, it's actually weird to have a children's policy. Like, some people had it. But for the most part, the policy was going to be paid on, like, someone older, someone who worked. You know, so that you could have that extra money. Children, not so much. So, should have raised a red flag somewhere, but... Anyway. So they get their 22 quid. Well, Margaret gets the 22 quid. And she sip in some of it. In the pub. So, this is the end of 1882. We go into 1883. And in January, Margaret Jennings, the teenager, she gets ill very suddenly. And she dies. And you'd think this would raise suspicions that, you know, some relatively healthy people have passed away in quick succession from weird illnesses. No, nobody's picking up on this. Nobody thinks this is weird. Well, nobody yet. Was the Sphinx 10,000 years old? Were there serial killers in ancient Greece and Rome? What were the lives of transgender, intersex, and non-binary people like in the ancient world? We're Jen. And Jenny. From Ancient History Fangirl. We tell you true stories and tall tales of the ancient world. Sometimes we do it tipsy. Sometimes we have amazing guests on our show. Historians like Barry Strauss, podcasters like Liv Albert, Mike Duncan, and authors like Joanne Harris and Ben Aronovich. We take you to the top of Hadrian's Wall to watch the Roman Empire fall at the end of the world. We walk the catacombs beneath the Temple of the Feathered Serpent under Teotihuacan. We walk the sacred spirals of the Nazca Lines in search of ancient secrets. And we explore mythology from ancient cultures around the world. Come find us at ancienthistoryfangirl.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you enjoy bizarre true stories, then the Useless Information Podcast is the podcast for you. For example, did you know that author Robert Louis Stevenson gave his birthday away? Or that there was a football team that played for six years before someone realized that the school never ever existed? Or that a dog in upstate New York was once placed on trial for murder? Well, to hear these and hundreds of additional fascinating true stories from the flip side history, be sure to check out the Useless Information Podcast. That's the Useless Information Podcast podcasting worldwide since 2008 and available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. Be sure to check it out. So Thomas Higgins, he's probably getting a wee bit wigged out at this point. You know, lots of death happening in this particular report. Ah, uh, fuck this for Game of Soldiers. Let's move out. And so him and Margaret, they move into a cellar at 27 Ascot Street. I think Margaret's still a char lady at this point as well. So she's, she's working. He's working. He's doing the odd carrying. Like, they're busy people. And Catherine, she moves to Latimer Street. So yeah, it's September 1883, where Thomas and Margaret have separated from the household and they move into their own wee dwelling, their wee cellar on Ascot Street. And eight days. They're living here eight days. And Thomas gets ill. And two days after that, 
he dies. Now, because Margaret has been paying into the burial society, she is able to, you know, get the burial sorted, like, pretty fast. Like, they are putting it together pretty sharpish. And she's open to get him into the ground as soon as possible. And so she's holding the wake in her house. They're getting ready for the funeral. They're getting ready to take the body out. And that's when her brother-in-law comes in the door with a doctor and a coroner. And not long after, the police show up. Margaret is pretty swiftly arrested. But her older sister, Catherine, oh, she has scarpled. She is gone. Catherine runs out the door, makes her way through the streets, quickly heads home. I don't know why they didn't think to send any couples to, like, her abode. Feels like it would have been a logical idea. But she goes, she grabs some necessities, and then she shelters in the community. So she goes to the Mackenzie's on Rockingham Street. And so she stays there for three days or three nights. And they sort of run errands for her and they pick up the bit she needs. And she pays them because she's got a ton of money. Think about it. She's been doing the commissions. She's also claimed life insurance policies. Her sister split it with her too. So she's got, she's got cash. Like physical cash. Now, she starts realising like people know she's in the area. They're going to know she's there. And so she doesn't want to stay there too long. And so she needs to move. But she doesn't want to run through the street. She doesn't want to, you know, have to cloak and dagger it. And so she takes a taxi. Like, this is a really smart way for her to get around the town. Because she can afford the taxis. And so she goes to Lydia Ann Street. And she stays at a wee boarding house there. And so she's in there for one night. She only stays one night there. Because she's feeling it's pretty hot. And she gets another taxi and off she goes to a boarding house on Mount Stewart Street, run by a one Mrs. Brooks. Now, she stays there for five, five nights, I think, in total. But then she wants to leave because Mr. Booth, he is taking an interest in this case that people are talking about all over Liverpool. He's like reading the newspaper and he's talking about how this woman is missing and, you know, they think she's involved in the crime. And she's like, oh God, what if they figure out it's me? And so, after day five, off she goes. But now she's thinking she needs to get out of Liverpool. And so she's heading for the train station. Now, she doesn't quite get the taxi there. She kind of gets near to it. And then she starts walking. She might be like watching her cash at this point. Or she might think, you know, they're waiting at the station and she wants a good distance to see if they're going to be waiting for her. So while she's moving around town as well at this point, the police, they still think that she's in sort of that dock area by Scotland Street or Scotland Road. And they think she's still in there because they think like the Irish community is hiding her. Um, I don't want to say like snitches get stitches, but you know, they're just convinced that nobody's grassing her out and they're all hiding out there. And she's, like, made her way halfway across the city trying to get to the train station. But she doesn't know where she's going. Like, she doesn't know this area too well. And so she has to ask for directions. And so she meets Mrs. Ward and she's like, I'll walk you there. So she walks her to the train station. And this is Catherine's way out she is on the home stretch. She's getting ready to go. And her and Mrs. Ward, they trundle towards the station, only to discover she's missed the train. But Catherine's like, it's fine. I'll just get the other train. So her and Mrs. Ward, they leave together and they go to the Tunnel Hotel for a drink because it's got a wee bar in it. And so they go for a drink and they're joined by some fella. And she's explaining to them after a few drinks, she's bought them a couple of drinks because they're seeing she's got money. 
and she says that there was a warrant out for her arrest because she was uh, selling her son's furniture and the people around her are kind of like, that's a very specific and weird thing to have a warrant out on you from. And there's someone in the in the hotel and they're like, I think that's Catherine Flanagan, who, if I'm not mistaken, is wanted for murder. And so word gets back to the Waverley Police Station to Inspector Keeley. And they're like, hey, there's a woman down in the Tunnel Hotel with a convenient and also a suspicious tale of why she's got so much money. Think maybe you should go check it out? And so Inspector Cayley's like, that's a good idea. And off he goes down to the Tunnel Hotel. And he gets there, only to discover that they're gone. But he asks around, and they're like, yeah, they're just down on Ono Street. And so, yeah, he heads down to Ono Street, and he catches her having her dinner, because she's having a wee bite to eat before her long journey on the train that she didn't get to have, because she gets arrested. Because Inspector Keeley, like nearly every other policeman in Liverpool, had been provided with a handbill of her description. It read, She was about 50 years old, 5 feet 2 inches tall and stout, with a fresh complexion and dark wavy hair which was turning grey. Her only distinctive features were two upper teeth which stuck out slightly and a scar on her upper lip. She usually wore large gold earrings and several rings and spoke with an Irish accent. Catherine had managed to, like, evade capture for, like, ten days. And it's all because she got a wee bit drunk in a bar and had something to eat instead of just, like, just getting out of town. Catherine had been on the run since the 5th of October, the day of the funeral. Uh, Margaret had been in custody all this time. So when they arrested Margaret, they noticed that there was a pocket on her dress which had a weird stain on it. And they go into the pocket and they find a poison bottle. And they, there's some fluff out the bottle. So they basically surmise that it leaked and caused the stain. They tested the bottle. Shockingly enough, the bottle contained arsenic powder. So they'd carried out the wee post-mortem, the wee autopsy and they knew that he had died from arsenic poisoning but they weren't quite sure what type of arsenic. Like initially they thought it was rat poison but it didn't have the same sort of compounds and so they were like really stumped because you couldn't just go out and buy arsenic at this point. Like maybe a few like decades earlier because they started to regulate it because you know the Victorians did start doing that after a while but for a long time it wasn't regulated you could just go buy it but then people get poisoned in their husbands and so they thought maybe we should make this a wee bit more difficult to you know purchase poison and so uh they did so they were trying to figure out how they did it now, well, Margaret is, you know, in prison, she turns on her sister right away, unsurprisingly, because, you know, she did leave her to the wolves. So she starts telling them about how, you know, it was all Catherine's idea. She arranged it. She just did as she was told. And that how they did it was my personal favourite was soaking flypaper in water to remove the arsenic because flypaper was still used to like kill bugs and stuff because you know ew and so they would use this separate it and then they would lace people's food with it so not only is she singing like a canary well Catherine's on the lamb but the police start investigating you know insurance policies so they found policies for 
Catherine's sons John, Thomas's first wife Mary, and Patrick Jennings' daughter Margaret, and uh, for you know, young Mary, Thomas's daughter. So after Catherine is caught, the two sisters are charged with the murders of four victims. John Flanagan, Thomas and Mary Higgins, and young Margaret Jennings. And in January 1884, the buried bodies are exhumed. So 10-year-old Mary Higgins, she had been interred for over a year. So she was in a decent state of decomposition. But she was recognised by her hair colour and her teeth by Thomas's brother, her uncle, Patrick Higgins. So they perform a post-mortem on her. And they see that she's suffering from some kind of lung disease. But like the rest of her organs are absolutely fine. Apart from her bowel, which is like yellow. And they're just like alarm bells are going off. They're like, yep, take out the organs, test them. And so they do some tests and they're like, the term is I think an abundance of arsenic in her body. Like there's just too much, so much arsenic. And they test the other corpses. And what do they find? Yeah, I know, you're shocked. More bloody arsenic. So the police know that they have all these life insurance policies, well, these burial society policies, on each of the victims, with the beneficiaries of each policy being either Catherine or Margaret. And they were there. They were present at the deaths of each of these victims or alleged victims, like they're there. So this is all taken into account, like the amount of poison in these people's bodies, you know, their proximity, their means, their motive, their opportunity. So when they went on trial at St. George's Hall on the 14th of February, 1884, all of this was taken into account. So the trial lasts for three days. And the jury then, after 40 minutes, like, they deliberate for 40 minutes. Like, it really does not take them long to come out and tell the court that they find Catherine Flanagan and Mark Higgins guilty for the crime of murder. Now, they're only charged with the murder of Patrick Higgins. They do bring the other deaths into account, But he is the only death that they're convicted of. And because they've been charged with this, and the punishment for this crime is, you know, death, there really isn't any reason as far as, you know, the judge and the police and everyone is concerned to, like, take them to court and charge them with the other poisonings. And this is where the plot thickens. Maybe. You see, when Catherine is arrested before the trial, She, you know, gives a statement to her solicitor and she says that she wasn't involved in any of the actual poisonings. What she did was just, you know, broker the, you know, the agreements between, you know, the burial societies, the agents and, and, you know, the the beneficiaries. Like, she just arranged that. She didn't do anything else. And then she starts talking about a secret crime syndicate of women who do this, who are part of this big scam, who would put into burial societies and just put through policies and murder people. And that there's a massive sort of poisoning ring and she names like six, six other potential victims and a few other women who are involved in this and that they're sort of involved in the crime. Like, and it's weird though, Because you have to wonder, is she simply trying to distance herself, like, from the crime and go, well, it wasn't that bad because I didn't do this. And then there's always the possibility of, what if there was a group of women poisoners in, you know, patriarchal, poverty-ridden Liverpool? Which I would be more inclined to believe, to be honest, if they weren't, you know, poisoning 
teenage girls and children. Because there have been, like, groups of women throughout history who, you know, have been involved in the poisonings of husbands. And groups of them. But this... This is not that. That's a bit more... Mm. But insurance money-wise, yeah, it seems like a thing that could be happening. And if you're in this interconnected community and crime breeds crime, I mean, there's probably something like that going on. Like, she couldn't be the only person doing it. And she's basically saying that all of these people are on the take because you've got agents involved and brokers and doctors who are providing the death certificates. Like, all of these people are involved in this ring. Now, the police look at it and they go, okay, some of these deaths are in fact suspicious, but because the only person, like, ratting them out is Catherine Flanagan, a known criminal who's been convicted of murder, there's not a lot they can do because it won't hold up because it's just hearsay. And depending on how long the bodies have been interred, there's no guarantee they'd actually get anything from it. So this does nothing. Both of the sisters have turned on each other and they're both going to the gallows. Margaret had offered to give more information on her sister, you know, in an attempt to save her life. But yeah, none of it, none of it was flying. And on a snowy morning at the Kirkdale jail, the two sisters stepped outside, making their way through the dusting towards an ugly, dark scaffold. They make their way up the steps, rosary beads around their necks, trying to recite prayers said by the Reverend, who was supporting Catherine as she trudged forward, and when they reached the top, the executioner placed the white bags above their heads, attached the nooses, and on the 3rd of March, 1884, the Black Widows of Liverpool, Catherine Flanagan and Margaret Higgins, were hanged. And so ends the story of the Black Widows of Liverpool. Now, if you liked my retelling of this terrible, terrible tale, feel free to rate and review five stars. Or give me some pity stars, because I've lost my voice, and yet I still talked this long. For you. I was expecting to do this quicker. Clearly that wasn't happening. Don't worry, I'll be taking care of my voice for the next month to make sure it is good, possibly great even, for the live shows. Now remember, there's um, events on in Dublin, Brighton, Manchester, and Glasgow. So the Dublin show is at Punt Comedy with the Shite Talk History Boys. In Brighton, I'm in the Carolina Brunswick. It's going to be really, really fun. That one is uh, it's a big old gay time. It's going to be fun. We have the Manchester show, which is um, <laughs> dubbed Witches, Witches, Spooky Bitches. <laughs> and then the Glasgow show, um, where my family are going to be. So it's going to be super fun. If you haven't got your tickets, get your tickets. I've still got like some early bird ticket stuff for the Brighton show. So go do that. Come see me. I'm awesome. I promise. I'm better in person <laughs> and when I actually have a voice. Um, so yeah, do that. I'm on all the socials, follow me there, share stuff, share episodes. Um, it makes all the difference and it also makes me feel really good about myself. <laughs> and I'm actually thinking of restructuring the Patreon so that it's like less money because I'm feeling of doing it like that. So it's just less because I just, I want to make it easier for people to access stuff, you know, because cost of living crisis and all that, and it feels, um, I think the merch one I'd have to keep up, but like the rest of them I feel like I can just siphon down into like one easy, like, I don't know, like a six quid kind of idea. But anyway, um, let me know what you think about that. That'd be good to know. And recommendation time. I bought books. I bought books. Um, for reading, I'm going to say um, American Sherlock by Kate Winkler Dawson. I finally bought it. I finally read it. It's really good. For listening, go listen to Trashy Divorces. It's a really awesome podcast and it's brilliant. 
go listen to Alicia. And for watching Death and Other Details. I am obsessed with the clothes. I mean, everything else is fabulous. But the clothes in this, specifically, I think it's the dog's tooth slash hound's tooth, however you want to call it. I'm really feeling it right now. And that just because I'm an old person in a not quite as old person's body. <laughs> but with that, I am going to bid you farewell. Adios. Au revoir. Avoir raison, my friends. Bye-bye.